Okie doke, here we are looking at the Plasmon, which I think was a leftover rabbit hole from, oh yeah, from Plasma Oscillation. So, in physics, a Plasmon is a quantum of Plasma Oscillation. Just as light consists of photons, the Plasma Oscillation consists of Plasmons. The Plasmon can be considered a quasi-particle, or sorry, can be considered as a quasi-particle since it arises from the quantization of plasma oscillations, just like phonons are quantizations of mechanical vibrations. The plasmons are collective, a discrete number, oscillations of the free electron gas density. For example, at optical frequencies, plasmons can couple with a photon to create another quasi-particle called a plasmon pol uh, polariton. Plasmon polariton. Mm. So yeah, plasma, let me just reread this over for myself. So it can be considered as a quasi-particle. And like phonons, they are quantization, uh, like phonons are quantizations of mechanical vibrations. So plasmons are discrete uh, oscillations of the free electron gas density. Okay. And at optical frequencies, it can couple with a photon to make a plasmon polariton. The derivation, the plasmon was initially proposed in 1952 by David Pines and David Baum, and was shown to arise from a Hamiltonian for the long-range electron-electron correlations. Since plasmons are the quantization of classical plasma oscillations, most of their properties can be derived directly from Maxwell's equations. Hmm. Explanation. Plasmons can be described in the classical picture as an oscillation of electron density with respect to the fixed positive ions in a metal. To visualize a plasma oscillation, imagine a cube of metal placed in an external electric field pointing to the right. Okay, a cube of metal placed in an external electric field pointing to the right. Electrons will move to the left side, uncovering positive ions on the right side, until they cancel the field inside the metal. If the electric field is removed, the electrons move back, sorry, move to the right, repelled by each other and attracted to the positive ions left bare on the right side. They oscillate back and forth at the plasma frequency until the energy is lost in some kind of resistance or dam damping. Plasmons are a quantization of this kind of oscillation. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So the role. Plasmons play a huge role in the optical properties of metals and semiconductors. Frequencies of light below the plasma frequency are reflected by a material because the electrons in the material screen the electric field of the light. Again, frequencies of light below plasma frequency are reflected by a material because the electrons in the material screen the electric field of the light. Light of frequencies above the plasma frequency is transmitted by a material because, sorry, yeah, above plasma frequency is transmitted by a material because the electrons in the material cannot respond fast enough to screen it. In most metals, the plasma frequency is in the ultraviolet, making them shiny or reflective in the visible range. Some metals, such as copper and gold, have electronic interband transitions in the visible range, whereby specific light energies or colors are absorbed yielding their distinct color. I need to read that again. Some metals such as copper and gold have electronic interband transitions in the visible range whereby specific light energies or colors are absorbed, yielding their distinct color. Okay. In semiconductors, the valence electron plasmon frequency is usually in the deep ultraviolet, while their electronic interband transitions are in the visible range, whereby specific light energies or colors are absorbed, yielding their distinct color, which is why they are reflective. 
It has been shown that the plasmon frequency may occur in the mid-infrared and near-infrared region when semiconductors are in the form of nanoparticles with heavy doping. The plasmon energy can often be estimated in the free electron model as E sub P, that's big E sub P, the energy of the plasmon, the plasmon energy, E sub P. Okay, great. Yeah, E equals H bar times square root of N times E squared over M epsilon naught equals H bar omega sub P. And this is... Um, N is the conduction electron density, E is the elementary charge, M is the electron mass, epsilon naught, permittivity of free space, H bar is the Planck constant reduced, uh, and omega sub P is the plasmon frequency. So just to say that all again, we have reduced Planck constant times the square root of the conduction electron density times the elementary charge squared over the electron mass times the permittivity uh, equals the reduced Planck times the plasmon frequency. Surface plasmons. They are those plasmons that are confined to surfaces and that interact strongly with light, resulting in a polariton. Okay, we heard a little about them earlier. They occur at the interface of a material exhibiting positive real, sorry, exhibiting positive real part of, of a material. No, interface of a material. I feel like there was supposed to be a preposition somewhere in there, but there is, an, or an indefinite article rather. Whatever. They occur at the interface of a material exhibiting positive real part of their relative permittivity. In other words, dielectric constant, like a vacuum, air, glass, or other dielectric and a material whose real part of permittivity is negative at the given frequency of light, typically a metal or a heavily doped semiconductor. Okay. The interface of material exhibiting a positive real part of the relative permittivity, in other words, dielectric constant, and a material whose real part of permittivity is negative at the given frequency. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. In addition to opposite sign, in, why, why? Okay, whatever. In addition to opposite sign of the real part of the permittivity, the magnitude of the real part of the permittivity in the negative permittivity region should typically be larger than the magnitude of the permittivity in the positive permittivity region. Otherwise, the light is not bound to the surface. In other words, the surface plasmons do not exist as shown in the famous book by Heinz Rather. At visible wavelengths of light, for example, 632.8 nanometers, um, provided by the helium neon laser, um, interfaces supporting surface plasmons are often formed by metals like silver or gold, negative real part permittivity, in contact with dielectrics such as air or silicon dioxide. The particular choice of materials can have a drastic effect on the degree of light confinement. Particular choice of materials can have a drastic effect on the degree of light confinement and propagation distance due to losses. Surface plasmons can also exist on interfaces other than flat surfaces, such as particles or rectangular strips, V grooves, cylinders, and other structures. Many structures have been investigated due to the capability of surface plasmons to confine light below the diffraction limit of light. One simple structure, structure that was investigated was a multi-layer system of copper and nickel. Mladenovic et al. reported the use of the multi-layers as if one plasmonic material... Oh, so, sorry, as if it's one... They reported the use of multi-layers as if it's one plasmonic material. Oxidation of the copper layers is prevented with the addition of the nickel layers. It is an easy path. Uh, it is an easy path. The integration of plasmonics to use copper as the plasmonic material because it is the most common choice for metallic plating, along with nickel. The multi layers serve as a diffractive grating for the incident light. Up to forty percent transmission can be achieved at normal incidence 
with the multi-layer system depending on the thickness ratio of copper to nickel. Okay, I'm skip, skip, skip. Surface plasmons can play a role in surface enhanced Raymond spectroscopy and in uh, and and in explaining anomalies in diffraction from metal grading, uh, like Wood's anomaly, among other things. Surface plasmon resonance is used by biochemists to study the, the mechanisms and kinetics of ligands binding to receptors, uh, in other words, su substrate binding to an enzyme. Multiparametric surface plasmon resonance can be used not only to measure molecular interactions, but also nanolayer nanolayer properties of or structural changes in the adsorbed molecules, that is, adsorbed molecules, pol polymer layers, or graphene, for instance. They may also be observed in X-ray emission spectra of metals, a dispersion relation for surface plasmons in the X-ray emission spectra of me metals has been derived by Harsh and Ar Agarval. Um, more recently, surface plasmons have been used to control colors of materials. This is possible since controlling the particle's shape and size determines the types of surface plasmons that can be coupled in, into and propagate across it. Um, this in turn controls the interaction of light with the surface. These effects are illustrated by the historic stained glass with uh, which adorn medieval cathedrals. Some stained glass colors are produced by metal nanoparticles of a fixed size, which interact with the optical field to give glass a vibrant red color. In modern science, these effects have been engineered for both visible light and microwave radiation. Much research goes on first in the micro goes on at first in the microwave range because of this wavelength. Material surfaces and samples can be produced mechanically because their patterns tend to be on the order of a few centimeters. The production of optical range surface plasmon effects involves making surfaces which have features less than 400 nanometers, which is much more difficult and has only recently become possible to do in a reliable or available way. And here's some nice uh, stained glass. It is quite vibrant. Ooh, and low res. Some colors were achieved by colloids of gold nanoparticles. Hmm. Uh, recently, graphene has also been shown to accommodate surface plasmons observed via near, uh, sorry, via near field infrared optical micros microsco my hmm, I cannot say the word microscopy microscopy whatever <laughs> techniques and then and infrared spectroscopy. Potential applications of gra graphene plasmonics mainly addressed the tetrahertz, uh, sorry, terahertz to mid-infrared frequencies such as optical modulators, photodetectors, and biosensors. Possible applications. See, the position and intensity of plasmon absorption and emission peaks are affected by modular, uh, sorry, by molecular adsorption, which can be used in molecular sensors. Um, for example, a fully operational device detecting casein in milk has been prototyped based on detecting a change in absorption of a gold layer. Localized surface plasmons of metal nanoparticles can be used for sensing different types of molecules, proteins, etc. Plasmons are being considered as a means of transmitting information on computer chips, since plasmons can support much higher frequencies into the 100 terahertz range whereas conventional wires become very lossy in the tens of gigahertz. However, for plasmon-based electronics to be practical, a plasmon-based amplifier analogous to the transistor called a plasmonster, plas plasmonster? <laughs> nice. uh, needs to be created. doesn't exist yet, I guess. Uh, they've also been proposed as a means of high-resolution lithography and micro microscopy. Darn it, again due to their extremely small wavelengths. Both of these applications have been successful or have seen successful demonstrations in the lab environment. They also have the unique capacity to confine light to very small dimensions, which, you know, yeah, let science be your guide for that. Surface plasmons are very sensitive to the properties of the materials on which they propagate. So this has led to their use to measure the thickness of monolayers on colloid films. Um, such as screening and quantifying protein binding events. Uh, companies like Bio Biocore have commercialized instruments that operate on those principles. 
Oh, and people are even looking on improving makeup by L'Oreal. Um, in 09, a Korean research team found a way to greatly improve organic light emitting diode efficiency with plasmons. And uh, a group led by IMEC has begun work to improve solar cell efficiencies and cost and costs through incorporation of metallic pardon me, metallic nanostructures using plasmonic effects that can enhance absorption of light in different types of solar cells, like a crystalline silicon, high performance, three five organic and dye sensitized. So that was one two, three, four. I think that is four different types of solar cell. I'm not great on my photovoltaic stuff. Oh, there we go. However, four plasmonic photovoltaic devices to function optimally, ultra-thin transparent conducting oxides are necessary. Full color holograms using plasmonics have been demonstrated. And lastly here, plasmon soliton, uh, mathematically, plasmon soliton. Mathematically refers to the hybrid solution of nonlinear amplitude equation. For example, for a metal nonlinear media, considering both the plasmon mode and solitary solution. A solid plasmon resonance is, on the other hand, considered as a quasi particle combining the surface plasmon mode with spatial soliton as a result of resonant interaction. To achieve one dimensional solitary propagation in a plasmonic waveguide, while the surface plasmons should be localized at the interfer interface, the lateral distribution of the field envelope should also be unchanged. Graphene-based waveguide is a suitable platform for supporting hybrid plasmon uh, solitons due to the large effective area and huge nonlinearity. For example, the pro propagation of solitary waves in a graphene dielectric heterostructure may appear as, as in the form of higher order solitons or discrete solitons uh, resulting from the competition between diffraction and nonlinearity. I'll admit that whole plasma soliton section, I don't really understand. Um, I, I get what this is saying, more or less. But soloplasma and plasma soliton, I don't know what solitons are. I could learn. Um, and I also have to use the facilities badly, so my brain cannot even think right now. Oh, look at that. That's really pretty. Um, there's that. Okay, bye.